It is burning platform time and the first one of 2024. There is so much on the table to discuss. And I can't think of anyone more incendiary than our good friend, Roman Kabanak. It's nice to see you, my friend. How are you? Morning, morning. I thought you were going to say insightful. Yes. I you got the wrong guest. Uh, incendiary. In, yeah, incendiary is you. <laughs> and just own it because, you know what, this is the year of us just calling ourselves what we are. Every time you open your mouth... And I see you on, I still follow, you are one of the few people that I follow on social media and laugh constantly because you tear into everyone. Uh, you love when people make assholes of themselves, which is regularly, especially in the political realm in this country. Indeed. You were uh, a, a, an original Cliff Central founder alumnus, along with Jonathan Witt when you started the Renegade Report, which was ahead of its time in so many ways. The two of you, before anyone else had founded any kind of political talk show you guys were doing some heavy lifting at that stage it was legendary gained audience in leaps and bounds and since then you've gone on to continue being a lawyer and a shit stirrer in your own capacity and you do the morning shot which i have to say is a tremendously insightful and useful and informative way to start your day well, thank you very much. The uh, Morning Shots, a YouTube uh, show that yes. myself and my co-host do. And um, I, I try to, for the first two years, we try to be really serious about South Africa and look at the policies and understand. And now we're just like, you know, this place, we're just going to call it Rito Danistan. Everyone is <laughs> has a very low IQ. From all the political parties are just moronic. A lot of the voters are moronic as well. So we're just like, you know what? This you get place, the government you deserve, right? You get the government you deserve and just have fun. So I said, to, I said to Pumi, and this is a great place to launch the conversation. It is an election year. There's a lot going on. Um, I said to Pumi, you love South Africa. And this is oh, what, yes. one of the reasons I find it fun to engage with you is when I'm feeling low about the things that you just mentioned, you say to me, but this is great. This is what we want. You want an incompetent, incapable government. He's exactly the opposite of Helen Zilla. She believes in the capable state. He believves <laughs> the best place to be is in an incapable state. That's right. Is that right? Absolutely. So explain your philosophy to Pumi. All right, so just very briefly. And to all of us. Very the, briefly. The state is completely broken. And the state, I'm talking about the edifice of you know the political realm and the institutions of the realm. Except we don't really have a state anymore. There's no monopoly on violence. There's no uh, basis for any infrastructure. And there was a third thing that determines what a state Well, we does. don't have borders. Yeah. That's right. Borders. That's the third one. We don't have any of those. So we don't physically, literally have a state, philosophically, spiritually, legally. So that means we can do sort of whatever we want. A Which lot of people use it. Ultimate freedom. And a lot of people use it to do crime, right? <laughs> Which is why we've got such a high crime rate. But for the rest of us... I mean, I've got, I've got two children. I've got perhaps many more things on the way. I can't think of any other place I'd rather be other than here because I can literally homeschool them if I want to. I can send them to any school in the country that I want to if I can pay for it. I can buy as many guns as I want to. I can, I can do whatever I want in this country. And it's fantastic and it's wonderful. And more people but, should be proud of that. But the ultimate irony is that you are also a lawyer. So. Was. I left that last year. Um, so you're not lawyering what? anymore? No. no, no, I'm doing other things now. Okay, or more all interesting right. things. All right. But yeah, the state doesn't okay. exist. Once you have that so, in your mind, so the rest when, makes when, sense. When, when the rest of us are getting worried about what the elections could deliver, you don't care. I used to be like that until very recently. But now I just don't care because irrespective of what happens, the state won't be fixed. Whether doesn't matter who takes over. Whether, whether, I mean, John Steenhays and Helen Zilla can run this country as a theocracy for 10 years. There's no army. There's no borders. There's no police. What are they going to do? Fix a few potholes, maybe? I mean, kudos if that happens, but no. So you're not looking for what so many in South Africa are, in that they're looking for a government that can fix things, make things work, make things efficient, make the trains run on time, sort out the state-owned enterprises, uh, close the borders and, and patrol them. Gaten McKenzie's doing that. We must talk about that a little bit this week. Uh, he's in a, in a high-vis jacket. On the border there. Yeah, yeah, yeah at the Limpopo I mean, River. Just think about this. With his ass crack out. A politician. <laughs> but I just think about this. Is that your takeaway? Is that his ass crack is Oh, my God. I, I, was, think it's great. I felt violated. Just think about this. A politician 
is manning our borders and and chucking illegals back into the Limpopo River. That's proof. Without that the, any help from the border authority and, and police. And the reason he's doing it is because no one is going to stop him. Well, it's good politically, and he can do it if like, he wants to. There aren't any army people to stop no. him, so he can do what he wants, which proves your point But responding way. to your question, like deep down I am very like close to fascist. Like I like closed borders <laughs> and law and order. And like Nayib Bukele from El Salvador, like he's my hero. Right. <laughs> oh, my right. God. But we don't have one of those in South Africa. So if you can't have the best, have nothing. And that's just going to be my view. Hmm. All right, Pums, now that he's completely upset the apple cart, we've got to – you can ask him whatever you want to ask him, and let's just set that up, but we've got a bunch of issues. So if you'd prefer, we can just get straight into the the subject. Hmm. So I – look, I think it's um, important this early in the year to kind of pull out – all the things that we are facing, that we're going to see coming at us, not just in South Africa, but throughout the world. And and I think that it is fascinating to watch it from whatever point of view. And this is the thing about being in, in the space that we're in. And so this anarchist point of view, <laughs> burn it all down. Great. It's important. It's important one, because one second. I'm not. I'm not saying burn anything down. It's, it's burning down by itself. <laughs> you, you're not taking any part in that. And we're not re- going to reverse it politically. So accept it. Look after yourself and your family and your people. That's it. Okay. So you become a, an individual, an isolated, atomized individual in chaos. Well, that is the big danger. So you shouldn't be that. You should. Ensure that, like the July riots in KZN were a great example of that. Mm-hmm. People found out who all their neighbors were and they stood together yeah, across yeah. highways. I still say that was like yeah. that was a big nation building moment. <laughs> Very really much was, yeah. And I've been to KZN <laughs> since, and you can see that those structures still exist. So don't yeah. become an atomized individual. That's what causes the chaos in the first place. Become part of your community, your local community. Play, play, play a role in your family. We start with the stuff immediately around you. Family is family's first. Because most very people easy. start worrying about the president and the nation. Oh, yeah, no. These are very big things that are unwieldy. And they don't care about you whatsoever. No, no, I, I mean, speak to, Cyril, speak to Cyril. Or but you can't escape, even forward. though you're an anarchist, you can't escape paying tax. You can't escape. Um, you can't escape the, 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 the ordinary. You, you can't get away from the potholes on the roads. You can't get away from an inefficiency. Yeah. Well, okay, so you buy a car that mm. uh, it's expensive. These things. So ultimately, you're saying the only way to make to insulate yourself from the the, the, the chaos and, and anarchy yep. is to have lots of money. Uh, well, you don't. Then, it, then it's paradise. Is well, that what you're you don't saying? rely on the state at all for anything, uh, which costs a lot of money. Yes, uh, for taxes, if you're self-employed, it's relatively easy to avoid for the most part. Uh, but if you are an employee, it's much more difficult. Right. I'm not saying this is going to be easy, but this is just a reality of living in South Africa. If you're self-employed and and operate in a cash only, <laughs> yeah, like a, like you have a spaza shop. <laughs> yeah, if you operate in a, a, a cash only environment, yeah. Yeah, okay. then then you you have you have some kind of insulation because don't forget that SARS actually have got permission to go directly into to your bank. To yeah, they can access your bank account but, yeah. and but, get but, their money. But remember, SARS only collects twenty percent of taxes; the rest is all compliance. Hmm. The commissioner of SARS has admitted this. He, he only collects twenty percent of taxes, and it's like customs and commodity stuff. That's interesting. But the rest is compliance. So V. Ruiz wants to know straight up: Do you vote, and are you going to vote? I voted for myself. Yeah, I remember you in had twenty nineteen. Yeah, we right. had the capitalist party with uh, with Canton, Canton Pillay, mm-hmm. and that's the only. Time I voted. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Ever, yeah. Absolutely. All right. Uh, a lot of people asking about Gaten, so maybe we start there. Do we have open borders in South Africa? You no. know, this is a massive story in America at the moment. And I'm always trying to draw parallels so we don't think we're the only country in the world with problems because there are big problems all over the place. Joe Biden's administration is coming under increased pressure that the southern border is just open. People are just literally walking across the Rio Grande, which is what people do here in the Limpopo. Some get eaten by crocodiles, but lots and lots of people are just walking across the border from Actually, Mozambique, more people, from Zim, from more everywhere. more people coming through uh, the, 
those uh, ways of getting into the country are actually injured or killed by elephants than crocodiles. Oh, my God. All right, so there are at least they don't have those in Mexico and, and the U.S. But people are coming here. You could call them uh, refugees. You could call them economic migrants. They're fleeing even worse places than us to come here. You don't think refugees. so? Why are you shaking your hand or your head already? What, 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 refugees from where? Zimbabwe. As far as I know, it's a, it's a state. It's democratic. They've got their own money and their own borders. And I'm not saying army. they're legal. I'm not saying they, they've called themselves There's no refugees. such thing as an economic refugee. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Helen Zilla got into trouble for that once, didn't she? <laughs> only, only if you come from the Eastern Cape, apparently. That's when you're an economic All refugee. All right, so do we have <laughs> open the, borders? No, we have no borders. No. Big difference. We, we, we have lots of corruption at the borders. We have insufficient border control. We have a very porous... Uh, system, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, but that's also not just it, right? Because the, hence the corruption. Is there also lots of people who get here on a plane? Mm. They're not coming across the border from Zimbabwe or Botswana. They also get you on a plane. How well, do like, you get from like, Pakistan to South Africa? You can't walk here. <laughs> yeah, I think they come so, by Mozambique as well. But but I've spoken to to magistrates and 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 police officers, and they keep telling me like if you if you do if you are a victim of a crime and the criminal is a illegal immigrant, don't take him to the police because then they go to court, he's out on bail, and they disappear. They don't know who he is. They don't have IDs. There's no identification whatsoever. So you actually take them to Home Affairs. And home affairs oh. processes and deports them. Oh, but that's I, an uh, that's a useful. There we go. There we go. First week of the year, and we've got a, a helpful tip. T top tip. <laughs> 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 but there's a lot a lot of story. I, I know quite a few people, and and they keep saying that half the time they're unable to to identify perpetrators of crime or suspects or victims of crimes because they're there's all, no records. There's no records. I mean, home affairs is a nightmare. We can assume some of those are South Africans, but a, a huge majority of victims of crimes and perpetrators of crimes cannot be identified. Are they foreign illegal nationals? Probably a lot of them are. Do you, do you uh, think that Gaten McKenzie is uh, just an opportunist here because he sees a, a way of embarrassing the government and making people think he's a practical guy who's doing things, or is there more to it than just a bit of posturing and grandstanding and opportunism opportunism that's all it is opportunism that's and Gaden mckenzie know, let's not so forget has, let's not forget who this guy was before he saw of, the opportunism in politics right you know this this conflates on a number of issues in south africa one of them being the proliferation of new political parties. Oh my I God. just saw a, a thing a from the IEC that between September and December of last year, there were an additional, I think, 20 parties that were registered with the IEC, including Roger Jardin. Yeah, including rem one remind me. Boos, both Boos of Bissane. Do you remember him? <laughs> and, uh, anyway. Just but, remind but me, we've got, we've got to about. talk about at least two of these. We've got to talk about Roger Jardin and their damp squib launch at the end of last year. And, and we're going to talk about and the MK party. That's but, it. But, but what it, it's indicative of is that we have a vacuum in terms of leadership. So everybody is thinking, there's no leadership, I'm going to do something about it. Right? That's the other thing. That Which you've been encouraging. I, I And I still do. I really, really still do. That's all the grift. And I think that, <laughs> and, and I think that um, what the Patriotic Alliance, which, by the way, was not started by Gaten McKenzie and Kenny Kunene. Kenny Kunene. They have just taken it over, mm. essentially. They have seen an opportunity as well. So I think also a grift. And this is one issue that they can bang on about because it seems to resonate. It's a populist issue mm. that is resonating mm. with a lot of people because when you are when you are oppressed, when you are feeling under by every other you what do you look for? You look for a weaker person to beat on. And that's what they're doing. Well, I'm just glad for once it's not the whites, so I support the PA and the minorities. Like for everyone else, it's like, oh, the whites did this, the minorities did that. You know, for once, it's like someone else. So I know Gaten. Uh, we did a vlog with him in Buffett West. We did an interview with him. The guy believes what he believes. And the guy does have very good reasons for being anti-immigrant. That's something that he's come into since he started the party and has spoken to his constituency. And a lot of the constituencies say, 
immigrants are just coming in and, you know. They take our jobs. Taking our jobs and creating spaza shops and doing better than us in some ways. And people are bitter so and resentful. That's right. So what's been very fascinating to watch with him. What's been very mm. fascinating to watch with him after the big stunt at at the at the river, <laughs> right? Mm. Is is also watching now on social media a very big push back from lots of Zimbabwean expats, Zimbabweans in South Africa, Zimbabweans in Zimbabwe, and stories around Gayton McKenzie's Zimbabwean exploits or lack thereof, trying to get into Zimbabwe, trying to do business in Zimbabwe, trying to get close to, according to what I'm seeing these reports, trying to get close to Mnangagwa and being part of the gold mafia and mm. being shut out. Mm. And mm. that this is why he has this huge vendetta, particularly against Zimbabweans. And this is one of the things that have been that have come up quite often with him and his rhetoric, right? His his illegal alien rhetoric is that he has targeted Zimbabweans and doesn't speak much else about all sorts of other foreigners. Because they're the, the most country. obvious sort of illegal foreigners. Like in America you're not gonna say look at, you know, Jap- Canadians. <laughs> Japanese illegal immigrants, you know, the Japanese are coming to take over. Yeah. No, it's Mexicans, Mexicans or Hondurans or whatever the case is. Guatemalans. Be. And you know, if you want to do business in Zimbabwe, you have to know the president. Like, guys, this is this is like, this is Africa. Like, why are we thinking rules apply? So you have to know the president to do business there. And if you get shut out, you get shut out. But that's and, the way to do business. And here, by the sound of things, because or if you know the president here, you lose everything by the sounds of it. But yes, you lose everything. The man has no friends. Have you seen him recently? <laughs> His only friend is Fikile, oh, and Fikile is retarded. Come okay, on. we'll get to Fikile. The man has many friends. We, so we started with Gate, and I'm rubbing my hands with glee because we've got to talk about the MK party. But before we even get to that, does anyone even, if he walked past you in the street tomorrow, would you know who Roger Jardine was? And I, I don't know the guy. I, can, I can't say I've met him. I don't have any axe to grind with him. He may be the loveliest person in the world. Uh, there are a lot of people I know who speak very highly of him. I cannot tell you anything about Roger Jardine. Can either of you help? So I've got a story. So this was confirmed by a source of mine. No, this was confirmed by a source of mine. So here was the plan. The plan was for Roger Jardine to become the president of the multi-party coalition, Moonshot Pact, whatever you call it. In return, they needed the DA's buy-in for that. And the DA and the multi-party coalition would have received a billion rand for this to happen. But if you look at Roger Jardine... Former UDF guy in Mandela's cabinet as a DG or something like that. The guy's basically an Mbekiite ANC guy. <clears throat> okay. So for me, you bribe the DA with a billion rand, you put Roger Jardine in charge of the Moonshot Pact, you're basically trying to make the opposition nullified. You're making them ANC light, literally. And it didn't work because the DA said, no, we're not... We got principles. We don't care about money. Maybe the only political party. In so this they, particular they had regard. to do something with their billion rand. Well, they said no to the deal. Right. They said no. No, to no. The deal. I mean that the 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 people who were offering them this money yes. now had to do something with this money. Well, they're given fifty million to Jardine to run this damn squib of a political party. You where think? where him and Rise Mzanzi are on a race to 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 nowhere. Like they're competing against. Yeah, I mean we never get, other. Listen, I I love Songhezo Zibi. I think he's a great guy, and I think he means well. Just like I think Roger Jardine might be. I don't know. Who funds but Rise and Zanzi? Who Why does? don't we know? Who does? Why don't we know? I don't know. You you meant to know these things. Where's this billion? You're our sleuth. Who, who is funding this billion rand that was the, supposed the to parachute? people that used to give money to Cyril. That used to give money to Cyril. So you got a lot of, you got a lot of if I may say, a lot of white corporate types mm-hmm. who know very well how to make money but have absolutely no idea how politics works. At all. And they keep thinking... And they try to hedge their bets. All we need to do is make a better ANC. <laughs> like, that's the only that's the only thing they got in there. We need a better ANC. Yeah, One, because they made like money. Like the Mandela ANC. They've made money. No, but no, no, no. They've also got the saviour complex where they want to save South Africa. You yeah. remember when Zuma was around? Yeah, they've made, they've made a ton of... And, and there's guilt. They've made a Leech. ton of money Leech. over the last they couple of years. To, and they don't guilt. want to save South Africa. They want to save their earning potential. No. What they are looking yeah. to save That's a bit of, there's, is there's a where bit they of, make uh, their money. Yeah. They have more money and than where they make their money. Uh, they have enough money to last a lifetime. They, but they want has that ki- ever stopped anybody? They want their kids to have the same lifestyle that they have in South Africa. Has that Simple it, as that. It, enough money has yeah. never been the, the, the thing that says to somebody, okay, I'm going to stop being an evil corporation now. 
They just want to make more money. Have we not learned anything from Purdue Pharma, right? So yeah, and for some reason, making think, enough money is yeah. not enough to stop a person from as, wanting to make more. As part of the equation, no doubt. But a lot of these corporate guys think that because they can run a business, they know how politics works, and they always get smacked in the face. Because Sarah was was useless, and Becky was useless. They didn't support Zuma. Which was unfortunate because then the Guptas and everyone else got hold of Zuma. I Tabo mean, Mbeki was th- th- not useless. They've destroyed everything. What? Tabo Mbeki was not useless. No, compared and to the rest. No, not at all. He's <laughs> probably the best president we've had. In the land of the blind. And, yeah. Uh, mm. He was the best president we've had. And uh, and for, for many reasons, right? We we had a, a, a co- an economy that was doing well. We, we had, had a budget people surplus. Who had a job. We had, yeah. We yeah, had a sure. budget surplus budget and we surplus. paid this. We would take, we would take the Mbeki years. Without even a hesitation, a moment of thought, we we, we would trade in fifteen Cyrils for a a, a a rewind back to ninety nine. We yeah, would easily, easily. A- and I will remind you of telling you that we are going to miss this Tabombeki years when you you did say so. In Jacob Zuma. You did say so. I really but I think Zuma. you know the money Judas. conversation. Okay, so I that, think the so money conversation uh, is an important conversation th- before we hold yeah. on about because the, there's so much talk about who funds whom hmm. and why, and the, there's the billion rand that has been touted by everyone. Even Jacob Zuma a couple of days ago told us that he was offered. Yeah. One point two billion, and Jacob Zuma, who couldn't keep his hands out of the till when he was <laughs> the president of South Africa, said, "No, I've got principles. I don't want your one point two billion." I think it was in return but for not nation- I think it was in return for not nationalizing things. Is that but correct? Who funds him? I don't think Jacob Zuma has any. I don't think anyone's funding that thing. Oh, not not to any big deal for now. Maybe the Russians, though. What? Be great um, what do you think of the MK party now? I've heard conspiracy theories and I've heard very sensible ideas proffered by people who are intelligent and who I, I think have a pretty good handle on things, but I cannot make it up uh, in my own mind. What, whether this is just, again, like he's just run out of options and this is what he has to do. Oh, he's got such resentment about the way ANC have treated him and he's just angry and he's lashing out and he's decided it's time. He's, he can do this on his own and he can bring the, the coterie of people who have been on his coattails for such a long time with him. He'll get enough sustenance out of this to survive until he doesn't anymore. And it's just like a, this is his last ship. Or he just really doesn't care anymore. And it's like crash and burn Stalingrad. What's going on here? So I think I think it's a stroke of genius. I think it's really good to take the ANC's. He's very logos. politically smart, this guy, and very popular. Very popular. In case it ends, sixty-three percent approval rating. Cyril thirty-two. Mm-hmm. So it's twice as popular. Cyril John Tinez is like twenty percent. And right? people have written him off, but he's not finished. Not in the slightest. Not in the slightest. I actually drove past in Kandla um, a few weeks back. and Oh, you saw it with your yes, own eyes. with my own eyes. And I wanted to go to the front, but there were literally 30 BMWs like on the road to the front door. So I said, no, thanks. But anyway, he's very, very popular. What he has done is taken ANC identity, MK. MK was the only thing in the ANC that sort of worked during the 80s and 70s. <laughs> it did, let's be honest. And uh, he's taken that for himself. He was the intelligence officer at the time, if I remember correctly. Uh-huh. And now he's saying, listen, I'm not, I'm not suspending my membership of the ANC. I'm still an ANC member, but I can't vote for it under Cyril because Cyril's a sellout to the whites. So what I'm going to do is take the elements of, of the ANC for myself, MK, and we're going to vote for this political thing. We don't know who the leaders are. There's no party list. No, but he was busy reprimanding people for jostling for position just yesterday. Already, yes. who, who are these people? But what he wants to do, I think what he wants to do is because he's so popular in KZN, he's, he's basically not allowing the IFP and the DA to have a coalition there ah, to take over KZN next so year. So that's the underlying story. So I think the leverage is if he gets 10% of KZN – and ANC is at 41% or so, and the EFF's at 5 he could have that leverage to say, well, you know, we can take KZN, but only with me. Now imagine what sort of concessions he can draw out of that. I think it's much more sinister than that. More sinister than that? I think it is much more sinister than that. I think what we are watching, and I hope that the, the intelligence are also paying attention, unlike... In July 21, 
I think what we are watching is we are watching a dog whistle that is creating a quasi-military operation that is, and and from hmm. the various things that we have heard him say, yeah. the pieces of video that we see, he is taking a, a very dangerous, narrow nationalist view of what the Zulu vote is in a vacuum where the IFP has lost so much ground, where the ANC is not strong enough in KZN, and there is no longer an elder statesman in the face of a Mangosutu Butelezi mm -hmm. to hold it all together. We have a very weak king yes. that has walked into the space, and we have a major um, unhappiness in the electorate as a whole. And particularly in KZN. Not just with the ANC, but particularly with Cyril Ramaphosa. I think it is dangerous to listen to Jacob Zuma say, I didn't know uh, people, there were pe Sutu speaking people in KZN, because he spoke about people singing Rea Morata Kaufela, you know, in all of the Ramaphosa, there's that song that they sing, and mm. it's me, me, right? Um, and what we are seeing, and, and using a paramilitary, Decommissioned, yes, old people, but creating a space that says, we are going to fight. Yeah, that's what he's saying. It's a dog whistle. <laughs> and if anything, if we learn anything from our lack of concentration around July 2021, mm -hmm. this man is gearing up to create two things, and he keeps saying and harping on about this, that the election is going to be stolen, that this, you, you know, we can't trust the IEC. So he's he's creating a, a distrust of the electoral process just to create enough of a space to foment violence. And that is why it is more sinister. That is why it's important for me to figure out who does pay for this, who pays for the tents? Who pays for the PA systems? Who pays for the T-shirts and the cars and the all of that mobilizing that you see? And he is popular. Mm. He is popular, but Very. also people are disgruntled. You know, this is why it is so much more sinister, and this is why it is actually very dangerous to have an organization that is a shadow organization. You don't know who funds it. You don't know who started it. You kind of says. Jacob Zuma, by the way, who is also the president of Sanko, which is an affiliate of the ANC in KZN. And, uh, mm. The fuck? Mm. So here's, this is much mm. more dangerous than an 81-year-old man who is feeling unloved. Mm. Okay. So this guy was willing. Twice, twice he was happy with the result of the IEC. He was happy with democracy. He was happy with the way that we vote and the way that votes are counted. He also spoke about why are votes counted in secret. Votes are not counted in secret. No, all in the this parties country, have agents, right? Yeah. But what he is doing is is subtly undermining democracy. The process. Democracy works for as long as it was working for him. Now that he's on the outside, hmm, maybe this democracy is not so. It's right. almost like he's a politician. <laughs> Well, do you have anything? To, do you have anything to add? Do you agree with Pumi? So I agree completely. I think perhaps he has he has some. Um, maybe he wants to become the the, the the warlord of KZN, very much like Mabuza is of uh, North, not Northwest. Where was Mpumalanga? Mpumalanga. Ismail wants to be the warlord of 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 Free, Free State. State. So these political parties are the vehicles. For, to make that a reality. And let us not forget, people keep saying democracy is so important, the constitution, X, Y, Z. People don't vote here. No one thinks democracy is important in this country. The only people who think that are, are, are people in the media, people within 10 kilometers from here. The average person in this country does not vote. The average person in this country does not know who the politicians are. They have no idea what policies exist under which auspices, under which umbrella of politics. Democracy is under threat by the ordinary people not voting for it. But these ordinary people are extremely responsive when the president, the guy who's in charge right now, at least theoretically, goes around saying, we will, they will take away your social grants if you don't vote ANC. I mean, this is appalling, appalling behavior from the president. Of course, it's a tactic. But it, it's, We expected it. 
But this is just not true. And of course, we have no one in a position to fact check him in the media because they're all in thrall. Well, the DA tried to fact check him yesterday. But and, and, and how did that go for them? Oh, so did the no, message get through? So Do you no. think that the average person in the Eastern Cape, who you've just mentioned, don't vote, don't care, don't really know what's going on. You think those people aren't going to hear that message? You're wrong. They're going to hear that loud and clear. No, they probably aren't. But that's the, and and the, 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 there are two indications that that tells us, us sitting here with our microphones and hopefully other people listening to, to us. Sure. It's our best it, hope. it also says to, to me that it, it tells me that the ANC is actually worried about the outcome because to have that conversation, a conversation that says, because they know that people are not going to go and read what the party platform of the DA says about uh, grants and NSFAS. They're not, you know. No. But, but what, they, what they are doing is the, the tactic that they are employing is one that says, we are better than the other guys because we have given you this particular thing. And if you don't vote for us, they go, because they are hearing the rumblings of people that are saying, actually, I, don't, I actually don't care about you. I actually don't want to vote for you. You have done nothing for me. And so that response. So, which, all oh. right. so, so I heard some internal polling going on. Uh, and the, the, these polls are sometimes very, very inaccurate. But I heard that they're projecting the ANC to be below 50% by a small margin, but still below 50%, which sounds to me like about right and that's kind of where the trends are going. If you've paid attention to who's our friend that we speak to uh, about Davi Skoltz, <laughs> who's our election guy we talk to every now and then, he pays attention to all the exit polls as they yeah. do the small municipal and ward elections across the country. And it sounds like it's probably going to be around 47%. What does that actually look like for a government, a national government? Well, Put aside your anarchist tendencies and tell me how you'd evaluate that. Well, I think I think the ANC will be very lucky to get forty seven percent. Really? Oh, yeah. No, I th you so think less is coming? Less, yeah. Low forties. Hmm. Low forties. Uh, they haven't solved the problems that cause people pain, like load shedding. <laughs> the minister of electricity was uh, two days ago. He's like, you know, our forecast for load shedding in twenty twenty four is some days we'll have it and some days we won't. <laughs> it's like the weather report. <laughs> it's yeah. Like, it's raining today. It's uh, not raining today. So th yeah. they've given up. Like they've given up for trying to solve this. I particular do feel problem, like they right? have given up in so many ways. I mean even Tandi Modise, who was talking about the borders and Gate and Mackenzie, it's like she's going, yeah. Well, that's wrong and he shouldn't do it and people shouldn't talk like this, but she's not doing anything about it. She's not like saying we're gonna arrest the guy. No. So it's like eh. Everyone's given up yeah. for, for a large part. So assuming that at 45%, I think they can cobble together a coalition between good, if good exists, which I have sincere doubts about, good, ATM, those sort of small small parties, the PA, they could get 50 51%. If it goes where they are at 40% and the ANC needs a, a 10 or 12% party, a lot, of people, a lot of people think EFF is a natural ally. They, I don't think so. They're not. They, they do not. There's a huge group of ANC people who absolutely despise Julius but they and are, are terrified of him. They are competitors in the same pool yeah. of votes. Yeah. And funny enough, whenever someone leaves the ANC, they never join the EFF, except you call Niehaus, because he's a retard. But for everyone else who's not, <laughs> they start their own thing, which is very God. interesting. Right? Why is Ace Bachelet? Why did he start his own thing? Why did Jacob Zuma start his own thing? I'm starting to think maybe, maybe there's a big thing to have a big broad coalition of the hard left, with the EFF being the center pin. But I can't see Ace and Jacob being second fiddle to, to Julius, Julius Malema. No, they won't. So, so I don't think there's a big coalition happening. But most importantly, I don't think they trust the man. I don't think they think Julius is that important as an individual. He's a bit of a cult. The EFF is a cult to him only, and the ANC is built on democratic centralism, and they can't understand and will never work with <clears throat> parties which are cults for the most part. Excuse me. So I think this is a good time to have a conversation about the EFF and where the EFF are going into this election year. I've repeatedly said here that the EFF have plateaued. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I quote you often on that. And I actually think that we are going to see them sliding back. Agreed. For a number of reasons. And and the last press conference that Julius Malema held, which was in KZN, I think, is also very telling. 
the things that he speaks about, I think that he is a little bit rattled by Songezo of all people. Because really? he spoke about him. Zibi. How so? He spoke about uh, him. He asked who the funders were. Yeah. Um, he, he only brings up people who, who are, are nipping at his heels. Yeah. He doesn't really talk about people he doesn't feel are a threat. Absolutely. He doesn't. He doesn't even discuss them, which is why he's never even acknowledged. Because Carl he Niehaus. needs to, you know, because, because <laughs> poor Carl Niehaus coming under such fire. Because he needs to, he needs to point his flying monkeys at someone, yes, right? He needs correct. to point his flying monkeys at someone, and so this is. Thank God, thank a God, white person didn't thank say God that. You said that. <laughs> 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 Jesus, it we'd is be in a trouble. reference to the Wizard of Oz. I know, Oz. but My still, God. you know how people are. You know how people are. Go on. <laughs> But it, it's important, right? Is because you can you can tell that there is definitely a little bit of trouble in that paradise. Also, why we haven't heard a single solitary sound from Floyd Shivambu or Buyisen Ndlozi for ages. Well, we still see Buyisen is do we Buiseni hear them? is very very concerned with Palestine at the moment. Okay, so yeah. a lot of what he talks about is right. is, yeah. is which really the doesn't ICJ, doesn't affect uh, most South Africans. Julius's greatest asset is Flo Shivambu's silence. <laughs> that man knows everything and he's loyal to a fault. Kudos to him. I can't wait till he gets arrested because I think that is inevitably coming up. There's so much evidence against Flo Shivambu specifically. Yeah. And if Flo Shivambu turns coat, the EFF's dead. But we'll see how much that can happen. But Floyd knows all the dirty secrets. He knows exactly who funds everything, where the money goes, and he's loyal to a fault. Everyone needs Every political party needs a Floyd Chivambu. I mean, compare him to... If he's loyal to a fault, Vicky he won't Day. sing. Well, if you put him enough pressure, maybe. Yeah. But but compare Floyd to Vicky Mbalula. I yeah, mean, who can't on. shut his mouth. Um, so let's go to that for a second, because I know we're jumping around a lot, sure. but there's so much it's, ground to cover. It's I told you. It's so, the, it, like this, Floyd Chivambu... Yeah. Floyd, Floyd, listen to me. Vicky Mbalula this week um, made comments about Gandla because he's clearly very irked by Jacob Zuma. And he's also Cyril's only real henchman left, right? Because the rest of them are kind of lickspittle. But also yeah, the great. ones that he would normally rely on are going, uh, not really. We're not sure we want to pin our colors to your mast. Because what's happening in the ANC is you're also seeing people scurrying left, right, and center. And I mean that very figuratively. Um, Figin and Balula went out on a limb this week, admitted that the ANC stood shoulder to shoulder behind Jacob Zuma during the Nkandla scandal, lied where it was necessary to do so. And he's now running wild trying to put out the fires that he started by this either slip of the tongue or purposeful and Machiavellian, if you believe he's capable of that. No, he's a three-year-old. You ask him something and he answers you truthfully. <laughs> That's the beauty of Ikele and Balula. I've got, I, have, I had children who were three. They're older now. And you say, did you do this? And they'll say, yes. Because I don't, I don't understand the concept of punishment yet. That's what Fikile is like. And he's never really been accountable for anything. No. So why so would he understand punishment? I, I think, though, if you consider who he was speaking to, the message landed. The message that he was giving out is a message that says, this guy, Jacob Zuma, when he was with us, we, we protected him, we did all, and now he's the snake that he is, is now gone out there to be against us. And the people that he was talking to will resonate with this because they will then say, Jacob Zuma, what a snake. They are not going to say, hmm, so you guys lied. Mm. They, they're not going to have that conversation. They're going to have the conversation. Do you think he did a cost-benefit analysis? They are going to, to take the, the conversation that Figile was having with these people is a conversation that says Jacob Zuma is a snake in the grass. Yeah. We protected him. He was When he was the leader here, and this is what we do. We protect our own. We lager around them, and that's the message they're going to take. The number of people that are having the conversation we're having that are saying, oh, these guys lied and they knew they were lying. All of that out the window for the people that he is speaking to. Yeah, but he's speaking to 100 people there, but a million people have heard him say that, yeah, we lied uh, and I, Jacob Zimmer still screwed us, right? I, I, it shows a lot for for your strategy. But even even like Nkleko came out and he says, this is the worst Secretary General in 112 years. And then Gwit Mantache came out and says, you know, you media guys, you must let him learn. Like he's still young. 
If your kid is 51, there's, guys, a, there's, a great, uh, there's a great video going around of uh, Gwede falling asleep. Yes. And like, this is recent. This is not like it's some old clip. It was three days ago. No, yeah. it was three days he ago. He fell it asleep was while Cyril was talking. This is how seriously dun dun. these people take you. And this is how seriously they take their own colleagues in the party. He went to sleep. I mean, also, that, can we stop? You just mentioned that Jay Z is 81 years old. He's an old guy. All of these people are so terrifically old that at least Fikile with his three-year-old uh, state of mind it seems to be uh, truly youthful in some ways. That's the only bit of youthfulness we have in the ANC at the moment. Am I wrong? Well, I'm secretly hoping he becomes the next president. Fikile? Yes. Because then... then, then <laughs> oh God, you are, you are just such a shit star. You know Menken, right? H.L. Menken, yes. one of the greatest mm. authors in, in the world. Mm. He had this, this quote, which I'm going to mangle completely, but he said, one day the will of the people will materialize to such a degree that a downright moron will be in the White House. I mean, it's happened in America with Joe Biden, but imagine Fikile Mbalula being the president of South Africa. It would just solidify Rito Danistan like you cannot believe we deserve it guys it's over nation. for the anc we deserve it as a nation all right so it's over for the I, ANC, i'm gonna take but we, we 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 must now have a conversation because i'm looking at the time and we're running out of time and there's still so much to talk about all right so let's talk so about either the, we speak faster no i suggest <laughs> or we choose one I suggest more we, thing we to look you, you mentioned how mbuyi sen and uh distracted to an nth the nth degree by palestine and and today south africa is making representations to the international Court of Justice, and they're going there to declare Israel a genocidal state. Um, what do we make of this? Should we, as, I mean, you know, the, the obvious retort to this, whatever your, your point of view, is that when Omar al-Bashir came here, we didn't take them seriously. And so now we're trying court, to, and, eh? no, I know, but, oh, right. but, but they are linked. This is a different quote, but this is the same quote that, Putin. Well, this is the other thing is that all you have to do there, and, and I think that this is part of the, the opposition, which would be Israel's retort to this, is to say, fine, but then why aren't you going after your friends Russia for the exact same reasons you're going after us against Gaza? Well, and the first question is, who is mm. behind this? South Africa didn't think of this on the so own. So where did it come from? I don't know. Iran? Maybe it's Iran. Maybe it's uh, someone in Britain. And South Africa's a patsy? And South Africa's just a moron and retarded enough to go do it, right? And what's going to happen in your estimation? Do you think that we're going to get our asses really, handed I to really us or do you think it doesn't matter? I don't care. It doesn't I, I matter? I don't care whatsoever. Like really. It's a, it's a complete... So I do what do you think, Pums? I do care. I, I think since October, since the, the events unfolding in the past couple of months, we here on this show have had a, a lot of, of conversation around all of the, the parts of this. <sighs> so one of the things I hated doing last week is reading the submission, the South African submission to the ICJ, which is 84 pages. You read the whole thing? It's only 84 pages. Jeez. Um, y- you were... Uh, Ex-lawyer, so you know mm. this about court documents. They're hell of a laborious things. They're, they're boring things, and they're completely repetitive, you know, because you yes. have to keep reiterating. because no, you charge by hour. <laughs> no, besides the charging by hour. But read it. S- South Africa's document is an impressive document. It is not what you think. When we've seen so many things coming out of this country. We've seen so many policy documents. We've seen so many submissions and white papers and all of that stuff. And, and they all look like mangled. Not all of them, but a lot of them are, are really like a manglement of stuff. Mm. This document is well thought out. This document is a vicious document. And they have they have quoted laboriously all sorts of um points to which that they are arguing and which support their argument and they are a terrible indictment on many people including Netanyahu himself in the Israeli government in the in the IDF and you must consider that what they are saying is they are saying there is this concerted effort by Israel at genocide, right? Mm-hmm. They want to get rid of Palestine and Palestinians. They are also saying that this incit- there is a deliberate incitement for a genocide 
and they have quoted many people and the things that they are saying and the tweets and the Facebooks and the this and the that, which was reckless to begin with. So it may not be what they, they wanted to say, what they intended to say. It may be exactly what they mean, right? But that evidence sits in front of this court. Mm. And this is, and, and you, you must understand that what South Africa is asking for is they are asking for the court to intervene and say to Israel, stop this, so that they can be a, um, a, a mission that goes into Palestine to figure out what's going on. This is, it's the, it's, it's the, the coming, it, the urgent interdict essentially, is what yeah. they're putting in front to of me, the court. To me, it's the biggest crock of shit I've ever heard in my life. To be honest with you, put me out. And that's okay. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay when that you look at war crimes of the past, since the, court, since the Cold War ended, you've seen the war crimes perpetuated by countries around this world. Uh, Israel itself in, in Syria, uh, um, Russia in Syria, America, I- everywhere. Mm. I mean, in war, war is war, guys. People die in war. Absolutely. Hamas wants to destroy Israel. Israel now maybe wants to destroy Hamas. People will die. That is how things happen in life. And, right? and, that and is for not South Africa to issue. take a stance in this particular thing, in this particular thing, when their allies like Syria and Iran and Russia and China have committed ethnic cleansing of their own multiple times for the past 30 years, and no one cares. No one cares unless Jews kill someone. This is all that this is showing me. And I'm not a big Israeli guy. I'm not Jewish. I don't actually particularly care. But you can see, and you can see the liberal anarchy here. And it's tyranny at its best. Either way, hmm. on either side, right? On either side, there's tyranny at its worst, actually. <laughs> And nobody is going to come out. I've said this before. Nobody is going to come out on the other side of this looking good. Not Israel, not America, not Palestine, not Hamas, not anyone. And the the thing about this particular submission for me, for South Africa, right, is they've taken the stance for whatever reason. Whoever funds it, whoever is supporting it, whoever's given them this idea, they've taken the stance. They've gone all the way to this court, and this is an opportunity for them to ventilate their spleen about this particular thing. Great. Mm. I really do. I think great for South Africa. Sure. Great for Naledi Pando. Great for, for all of the things. Cause, but the fallout is a terrible thing. Yeah. The fallout for Israel, no matter how this court oh, goes, no. because it's going to ventilate all of this, this Israel's shit, fine. The right? fallout for South Africa. The fallout for South Africa, politically, economically, is not going to be great. We wake up this morning and Morocco, who actually also has a judge in the panel that's going to be listening to this, is now Morocco, Morocco over South Africa is now the chairperson of the UN Council Humanity, right? We yeah. wake up this morning to this news. Yeah. Morocco. And what does South Africa Morocco, say about Morocco? Morocco, with all that's happening in, in the Sahara. What does, right? what, does South, what does the ANC say about Morocco? Oh, they're ethnically cleansing the West Saharans, Saharians. But what this them. also tells us is Z- it tells us. Zawahari or whatever. By, yeah. by it's over named after one of Brad and Angelina's kids. Yeah, your, your, your friends involved. By there, over 30 vo- <laughs> votes in the UN yeah. General Council, Morocco trumps South Africa. Because South Africa and the exceptionalism that we have in our minds of who we are and the yeah. voice that we have is no longer there. It never was we are there. not who we think we are. It never was there, Pumi. It's all bullshit. We <laughs> are because, not who we think we are. Just because Nelson Mandela went to an Oprah for five times doesn't make us great. We never were. This is going to be... We never were. It's, it's going to be... So, yes, at 11 o'clock, it's going to be telestreamed all over the world. I mean, just... Uh, journalists from all over the world have descended on The Hague. They can only accommodate 30 of them, but apparently they had like 100 submissions. That's because usually no one cares what this it. court does. It's, it's going to be... All you need to know is that the best people in this country, legal minds went there. John Dugard, a legend. Uh, I forgot the other advocates, I do apologize, but they're also extremely competent, extremely capable. Those advocates, and then they take those Jeremy advo- Corbyn. Those advocates would never be appointed judges in South Africa due to their race, right? Those advocates would never be given a huge budget to, to prosecute corruption in South Africa. 
those advocates will take on this case and you pay lots of money to go, you know, destroy Israel. They'll never be used in here in South Africa to the best degree of their capability <clears throat> because why the ANC doesn't give a shit about the local people and BE comes in and all that other stuff. But so we use these advocates to the best of their ability to screw, try to screw Israel over. We'll never ever do that to fix South Africa. That's the essence of the story for me. Hey. Complete distraction. Yeah. <laughs> it's a complete Patrick distraction. Patrick says in the comments, the ANC say we have a moral duty. Wow, the quiet diplomacy with Zimbabwe really worked. Russia invades Ukraine. What a joke. Yeah, so there, there's hypocrisy <sighs> there, here. But there's, this, and this is the thing about our foreign policy at the moment. It's all vibes, right? It's all just vibes. It's vibes. It's the, it? the, only minister I would, <laughs> the only minister I respect is Bandor. Really? She, yeah. No, she's, actually, she's actually really good. I don't agree with her. Oh. But as a minister... And as, as a communicator, she's actually very good. Okay, well, that's an interesting thing. I agree with her on some things. Yeah. Okay. No, she's, right. actually been, this, she's actually been really good. This is, this is it, whatever happens, and it will be interesting also to see if South Africa are willing to take whatever the result is. Right, because they they don't take the ICJ seriously when it doesn't suit them. Yeah, they're willing to take the no, ICJ they, seriously. So that that'll be interesting. But today, South Africa's oral arguments start at eleven, and tomorrow it will be Israel's uh, oral response to South Africa's argument. Whatever happens, it is it's it is worth watching because this is something that a lot of people are going to be talking about for a long time and it will have an impact on South Africa and South Africans. This is about who your friends are. This is about where you stand in the world. It's big pieces moving on the geopolitical chessboard. And I don't think South Africa knows that they are not, they are not an important piece. Which is why perhaps we should support KB Dependence. Oh, okay, you want to bring that in at well, the end. Well, why not? Yeah. Okay, well... I think we should. Th this is... This is such a thorny thing because I don't know if the Western Cape could manage on its own. I don't know whether that's a possibility or not. Why do you? Why are you in favor Easily. of this? Why do you think this is interesting? So here, so South Africa, can we can we agree that South Africa is a colonial construct, right? Sure, constructed by the British. To no, that's why we've got Debele, Debele people and yeah. Matabele people. That's why the Sutu. Got, that's why right. Eswatini yeah, sure, exists. Sure, that's sure, why sure. the Sutu exists. Right. I mean, the Cape was British and the rest were Afrikaners. Then the British took over. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a imperialist right. concept, the borders of South Africa, when they do exist, which they don't currently. So the Western Cape has always been, historically, culturally very different. It always has been um, separated from, from the rest. There was, you, there was a suffrage based not on race, but on land ownership, if I remember correctly, irrespective of race. It always has been a far more progressive place than the rest of South Africa. In terms of economy, land size, it fits everything. It's bigger than Singapore. It's bigger than a lot of very successful small states. Okay. And at the end of the day, I mean, if fundamentally South Africa votes for the ANC in alarming numbers and in the Western Cape they don't, we do care about self-determination. It's in our constitution. We care about the self-determination of the Palestinians and the Western Saharaians and whoever else. Uh, why can't we care about the self-determination of the, you know, people in the Western Cape. The Republic of the are, Western Cape. Who are ethnically very different from the rest of the country. It's 50% coloured. It's apparently that's one of only two places in the world where you have a truly indigenous mixed race very population. So. The only other one being in England with the Caribbean Windrush generation of course. changing the, the, yeah. the, the population composition of places like London. Yeah. South London in particular. So I think independence is happening de facto. Mm -hmm. Politically, it's already happening. There's already a separate police force down there through LEAP officers. There's already, uh, well, I mean, the DA is useless in this regard, but they could have done a lot to to sort of, uh, pri not privatize, but to bring the railway and the police into the clutches of the provincial government. I think it's really happening. The only problem is borders, which they can't or won't enforce. But I think it's really happening as we speak right now. What do you have to say about Cape Independence, Pums? Anything? I think that the Western Cape is still very economically still integrated into the rest of South Africa's economy. And I think that an independent Western Cape is, is not a, it's a non-starter. I think it's a non-starter for many <laughs> reasons. And interestingly, you say that, you know, looking at what's happening in KZN, 
there will there will not be an independent Western Cape before there is any kind of secession conversation in KZN. Which is why you should support MK. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it it really won't. Which is why you support it just of won't. Course. And, I fully and agree for, with you. And and the the conversation will remain a non-starter for a very long time. Simply because they, there's just <coughs> too much disparity. There's too much difference between even as you say ethnically different, sure. you know, all of those things. I think there's still too much um, of an integrated consciousness in the nah, various it's too much growth from the Western Cape. Come on, for me, integrated <laughs> consciousness, what is this? No, no, not independent, <laughs> interdependent. No, but there's no interdependent consciousness. With, with, with the rest of South Africa. Nah. And that's why I think it's a non-starter. I think it's a, I, it's a yeah. wonderful conversation. I'm, I'm very it's sorry that we're running out of time here, guys. We've run out of time. Um, very, very good start to the year. Lots to be excited about. There's a lot of enthusiasm about all of this, even though some of it is pretty dire. So, I mean, just one last thing. It's an election year. Yeah. There's 200 elections this year across many different countries. Yes. I can't think of a less excited country than this one about the election. <laughs> it's, it's, it's in May sometime, no doubt. It's four months to go and no one gives a shit. I am so interested in this May conversation. <laughs> Where did that come from? I got it from three different sources. Because they, they can't do it in winter because they're worried about load shedding. And if they do it after winter, they give you stage six, stage eight load shedding for <laughs> three weeks. They're Except lose. A, a winter election is a good thing for the ANC. Why? Because people are less likely to show up and the... And, oh, and yeah, when yeah, we right. have few people showing up, it, but it helps them. No, the DA part. wins. The DA wins. DA wants very low turnout because they their people come out. The ANC guys don't come out at all. <laughs> the guys come out. Well, let's wait and see. It's gonna. I'm excited about it, despite Ramon not being. I'm. I'm actually cautiously optimistic. Are the words that I've used? Just before. expect chaos and brimstone. Don't expect <laughs> utopia, please. No, I'm chaos not a utopian. And Good. Brimstone. Don't worry. Chaos. Either way, it's going to be lit. <laughs> Chaos and brimstone. All right, catch Ramon on his own morning shot on YouTube. Uh, lots and lots of people do, and I'm very happy that it's been such a success. You are, uh, <laughs> you're a very unique thinker, and I like having your point of view here. So I'm sorry it's taken us so long to get you back. Thank you for having me. On what the a burning pleasure. platform. All right, hell of a way to start the year, Pums. We will see you next Thursday. Oof. And everybody, be good uh, and if, look out for that brimstone. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, everyone. That's the burning platform. We're out.